Hi, I'm Lawrence Rinder. I'm the director and chief curator of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. And today I'm gonna to lead you on a virtual tour of the exhibition, Rosie Lee Tompkins, A Retrospective, which I co-curated with Elaine Y. Yao. Start by reading the introductory text panel and then we'll begin the tour. Rosie Lee Tompkins, A Retrospective. Rosie Lee Tompkins is widely considered to be among the most accomplished and inventive American quilt makers of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Indeed, her renown has grown to the point that her work is no longer considered solely within the context of quilt making, but is celebrated as one of the great American artistic achievements of our time. This remarkable reputation is based on fewer than three dozen works, the only ones that have been publicly exhibited to date almost exclusively in the context of group exhibitions. This retrospective gives visitors the opportunity to see a trove of almost 70 of Tompkins quilts, pieced tops, embroideries, and decorated objects, with most of them making their public debut. Rosie Lee Tompkins, a pseudonym adopted by Effie Mae Howard, was born in Arkansas in 1936. She learned how to quilt from her mother as a youth, but did not begin to practice quilting professionally until the 1970s, when she was living in Richmond, California. She believed that her artistry was a gift from God, and she often made quilts directed toward her own healing and spiritual life, as well as to honor members of her family. At times, her works touch on contemporary, even political themes, and they often reveal a wry and subtle sense of humor expressed through uncanny juxtapositions of imagery, embroidered witticisms, and a playful and irreverent use of material and color. Tompkins quilts rarely conform to the dimensions of a bed, the traditional standard, and they reflect an improvisational approach to composition. In many cases, they have no obvious orientation, so the curators have decided how they should be hung. And while most of Tompkins textiles are referred to as quilts, this term technically only refers to works comprising pieced tops, internal material and backing that have been sewn together, a process Tompkins herself rarely undertook, instead leaving this finished work to other local quilters, including Willia Etta Graham, Irene Bankhead, and Johnny Wade. Tompkins' artistry lies primarily in the extraordinary combination of fabrics, patterns, and techniques that characterize her pieced tops. This exhibition marks the first in a series celebrating the donation to BAM PFA of more than 3,000 quilts by African-American artists from the estate of the Oakland-based collector Eli Leon. Rosie Lee Tompkins, a retrospective, is organized by director and chief curator Lawrence Rinder and Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral curatorial fellow Elaine Y. Yao, with curatorial assistant Lucia Olobunmi Momo. The exhibition is made possible with major support from Nyan McAvoy and Leslie Berriman and the estate of Eli Leon. Additional support is provided by Francis Bose, Anthony and Celeste Meyer, Margarita Gandia and Diana Campoa Moore, Topher Delaney, Faith and Stephen Brown, Joyce and Mark Hulbert, and Myra G. Block. In the first gallery is a selection of Tompkins quilts from the 1970s and 80s. The works here give a sense of her range of materials, styles, and techniques. On this wall are two quilts that suggest how Tompkins was simultaneously drawn to a kind of dynamic visual chaos, but also attended to rather strict thematic, formal, and material rules. In this piece, which may at first look like a, a kind of a very random assortment of uh, very disparate um, materials, there is in fact something that connects all of them. And that is the fact that every single piece of fabric here incorporates some kind of needlework. Uh, most of them are found uh, pieces of embroidery uh, that she has cut into squares and assembled into this composition. There are a few places in this quilt where Tompkins herself has embroidered text, specifically biblical scripture, onto the surface of the quilt. Another very interesting element of this quilt is the central medallion, which is a term in quilting for the central image or form that, uh, that one often finds. In this case, it is a found embroidery of Christ. And this is significant, especially uh, you know, given that this is the earliest work in the show from the 1970s, 
because this is a theme that occurs throughout her work and throughout many pieces in the exhibition, uh, allusions to Christ and to Christianity. And indeed, Tompkins herself uh, credited God with giving her the capacity to make quilts uh, and um, attributed her abilities as an artist to, to God. In this next quilt, again, uh, what may at first appear to be a kind of a random, almost uh, chaotic assortment of different kinds of materials and fabrics, when we look closer, we can see that there is a coherent and consistent theme in the work. Uh, and in this case, it is flowers. Uh, almost every piece of fabric in this quilt has an image of some kind of floral pattern or motif. Uh, the vast majority of pieces in this quilt are what are known as half squares. And as that term suggests, a half square is half a square, a square that's cut into a kind of diagonally across the middle into two triangles. And you can see here that she's assembled uh, half squares of various sizes across the surface of the quilt. One of the unusual things about this quilt is that if you look at the lower left, you'll see that there is embedded in this field of half squares a small medallion that is composed of a grid of very, very small blocks. Uh, these blocks, too, uh, share the same floral motif as the half squares, but uh, they're almost camouflaged within this overall composition. Moving to the left in the same gallery, we see a group of works, uh, four more quilts, all from the 1980s. And in this first gallery, what we're really doing is trying to give a sense of how even in her early work uh, in the 1980s, uh, you can see an incredible range of styles, approaches, and techniques. So to begin with, we have this quilt, which was made of velvet and velveteen. And you can see here that she's really focused on the motif of the half squares. You can see all across the composition, lots of little triangles of various colors. And she's divided uh, the half squares into sections using strips of colored fabric. It looks like they're mostly or all uh, green strips. And this creates sections within sections. Uh, so there are kind of quilts within quilts, if you will, across the composition. Another interesting thing about this particular quilt is that here she has created the quilt itself using a technique uh, called tying, where she literally ties the front, the, what we call the piece top, to the back, uh, which is something you can't see, but it's what holds the inner batting together and has uh, pulled all of this together using lengths of yellow yarn. And you can see those here on the surface. They look like little yellow stars, but those are actually the ends of the yarn that she's used to connect the front to the back. Uh, and as I said earlier, Tompkins herself was not that interested in quilting, technically speaking, with quilting being the practice of attaching the piece top to the batting and the back. Uh, she was really primarily interested in just the piece tops, but there are a few instances, and this is one of them in this exhibition, where she has finished the, the quilting, and in this case used a technique that uh, itself adds a considerable degree of visual interest. Uh, in this particular quilt, she's also added a decorative border. This is another velvet quilt, and uh, you can see here again, this, uh, there's a kind of remarkable balance between order and disorder. Uh, there's a suggestion of a grid. Uh, there's a certain kind of consistency as you go across the picture. It all organizes itself almost architecturally, and at the same time, she is combining uh, in a kind of peculiar way, a wide variety of different techniques, the half squares, uh, strips, blocks, and so on. And another thing that you can see here is the dramatic shifts in scale that she employs. So in some cases, the half squares are quite large and you know, readily visible. And at other times, they're incredibly small. Uh, you know, each little half square might be just a quarter of an inch in size. Uh, you know, incredibly tiny details uh, 
quite unusual uh, in quilt making to have this kind of um, dramatic shift in scale of the individual pieces. This is uh, a somewhat unusual example for Rosie Lee Tompkins of a quilt incorporating denim. Uh, denim quilts um, were something that one does see in African-American quilt making in particular. And for those of you who have seen some of the G's Bend uh, exhibitions of quilts from the, the town of G's Bend in Alabama, you'll recognize this approach to using uh, old worn blue jeans as a material. In this case for Tompkins, the blue jeans create a really wonderful opportunity to explore what is essentially a monochrome um, composition, all uh, you know, restricted to various shades of blue from dark to light, depending on how worn the, the jeans are. Uh, another fun element of this is the way that she has included the pockets of the jeans, and in fact, the pockets themselves, uh, in a way that kind of that squarish shape of the pocket serve to dictate the, uh, the, the pieces of the composition, that is the squares themselves, which are repeated throughout and form the basis of this kind of checkerboard uh, motif. Another work that uses uh, what I'll call it a checkerboard, or uh, it's actually a series of stripped squares that have been sewn together, is this velvet piece, which is again, virtually monochromatic. Uh, it's restricted to various shades of green plus black. And uh, I will pause here to say that one of the really distinctive and wonderful things about Tompkins' work is her use of black, uh, which is often incorporated as a contrast to very saturated uh, and bright colors. And as in this case, really sets off the color in a wonderful way. Uh, this is a, you know, obviously abstract uh, design. Uh, there's no imagery here, and it is limited very much in terms of the palette, and yet somehow this piece manages to, at least to me, come off as a very powerful emotional statement. It's hard to explain exactly why this piece uh, has such emotional resonance, but to me at least, uh, it does. Going around the corner, uh, we encounter a number of works that uh, suggest the really amazing breadth of Rosie Lee Tompkins' practice and her willingness to go into some pretty eccentric spaces of creativity. So here we can see in this small quilt, uh, she's working exclusively with men's neckties. And the way that this piece evolves compositionally is related in a way to how she developed the denim piece where she used the form of the pocket, that kind of square shape, uh, to dictate the shape of all the individual pieces and the pieces and therefore the composition as a whole. And here she's done the same with men's neckties, taking that fundamental strip form and using that uh, as a logic for the piece. So she builds the, uh, these kind of blocks out of uh, multiple strips, which she then sews together into an overall square composition. This next piece, uh, here we're showing the front and the back in the actual exhibition. You only get to see the front, but uh, here you see the front and the back of a dress that she made for herself of pieced velvet uh, and velveteen. Uh, and this is really a wonderful example of how, for Rosie Lee Tompkins, the quilt really seems to have been an extremely personal expression and a way of, you know, perhaps externalizing inner states of mind or, or personality and literally uh, taking those inner feelings uh, and conditions and putting them on the outside. Um, I'm not sure if she ever actually wore this dress, but there are actually multiple uh, examples of, of works like this in the collection, uh, various uh, kinds of clothing that she made using the techniques of pieced quilting. Uh, in this piece, uh, what we're seeing is applique, that is to say pieces of fabric that have been sewn onto a backing, in this case, a sheet of black velvet. And I was 
speaking before about her really wonderful ability to use black as a way to set off various kinds of uh, colors in her quilts. And this is a really good example of that. Uh, these are relatively muted colors for her, but against the black background, they really stand out in a, in a wonderful way. The arrangement of shapes here is obviously very unusual and doesn't seem to have uh, much of a clear rhyme or reason, although there is a subtle sense of a maybe an underlying grid. You have some strong horizontal and vertical elements, but a lot of the elements really seem to float in this kind of um, deep space. And you know, perhaps this is outer space, maybe it's the deep sea, it's some, but it does feel like some kind of pictorial space that we've entered into and are encountering these various uh, shapes and forms, some of which even begin to suggest uh, living things like this peculiar, uh, almost double crab-like uh, red form at the bottom. And you'll notice at the very center of this composition, she is actually uh, applique a little yellow fish. Uh, it's a found fish. She found it someplace, um, a little piece of fabric in the form of a yellow fish, and she's put it on there along with a number of diamond-like spangles that she has attached to the black, which are very suggestive to me of uh, stars in the sky and something that really underscores the degree to which I feel the, the black in particular for her often was meant to be suggestive of a kind of um, real or pictorial space that we can relate to as uh, through our experience of being in the world. You'll also notice on the right here uh, an embroidered name, Effie. Um, this was Rosie Lee Tompkins' uh, given name, Effie. Her full maiden name was Effie Mae Martin. Uh, and then when she married, she named Effie Mae Howard. The name Rosie Lee Tompkins is a pseudonym that was suggested to her in the mid-1980s by Eli Leon when Eli began to uh, promote her work and present her work in exhibitions. And uh, Effie Mae Howard, being a very private person, didn't really want uh, the works out there under her own name. And so uh, she accepted uh, Eli Leon's proposal that the pseudonym uh, would be used when her work was uh, exhibited or published. And this allowed her to maintain her privacy and at the same time get the work out there for people to enjoy. Uh, so here we see on the left the work we've just spoken about, and then on the right uh, another piece. And this uh, work is in a style that's called crazy quilt. Uh, and crazy quilts, um, it's a, a style of quilt making that goes back at least to the 19th century, maybe earlier, where quilt makers would uh, try to make coherent compositions using an incredible variety of eccentrically shaped pieces of fabric. Um, but even within this tradition, uh, Rosie Lee Tompkins' crazy quilt is unusually crazy. Uh, there is more diversity of, of form and variation across the surface in terms of color, tonality, and shape than there is even in a typical crazy quilt. Uh, when we were going through the, the archive that was left to us in the Eli Leon bequest when he left the museum, uh, his entire collection of 3,000 quilts, including all of these quilts by Rosie Lee Tompkins, one of the things we found was this uh, business card that um, uh, Rosie Lee Tompkins, or also known as Effie Mae Howard, uh, had made for herself probably in the 1970s. And you can see that she identified uh, professionally as a maker of crazy quilts and pillows of all sizes. Uh, and it was uh, probably in this uh, guise or this uh, you know, uh, kind of moment in her career that she met Eli Leon. She was uh, selling uh, probably crazy quilts and pillows at a flea market in Marin in the mid 1980s. And Eli Leon, uh, who was interested in textiles uh, happened upon her and asked uh, if he could see more of her quilts. Uh, she 
I think she took him to her home in Richmond, showed him more quilts, and he became really convinced that she was uh, quite an artistic genius. And uh, he, from that point on, from 1985 on, became her champion and he helped her source fabrics. He, uh, he arranged to have her piece tops uh, to be quilted by other quilt makers locally. He uh, helped to sell her work and he arranged numerous exhibitions of her work uh, from the 1980s on. So moving uh, to the left, we see a couple more uh, pieces that incorporate uh, the technique of applique, where you are sewing other pieces of fabric onto a backing. In, in this case, with this uh, pair of works, very small works, these are only a couple feet uh, high, if that, uh, there are pieces of, uh, pieces of fabric that are uh, attached to, appliqued onto a piece, two pieces of gray flannel. And the kind of eccentric or uh, somewhat haphazard arrangement of pieces echoes the work that we were looking at earlier with the uh, pieces sewn onto the black velvet. But in this case, uh, these, both of these pieces are uh, kind of cohered or uh, there's a focus to them, which are these two crosses, which stand out very clearly against the gray flannel and indicate that these were, uh, on some level, uh, works of uh, devotional or spiritual um, uh, themes. Uh, again, they're very small, so very, very personal, obviously not meant as a traditional quilt would be to cover a bed. These are uh, a very different kind of textile, uh, something meant to be really looked at and meditated on rather than used in the conventional sense of a, of a quilt. Uh, this is uh, a really wonderful, uh, kind of ebullient, very colorful, uh, energetic piece. Uh, like some of the works we've looked at, again, a bit haphazard in terms of the composition. Uh, there doesn't appear to make be much rhyme or reason to the arrangement of the uh, materials that cover this red fabric, except that there is a sense of all overness, that is to say, you know, an even distribution across the surface of these various uh, very diverse found materials uh, that includes uh, everything from embroideries to uh, pieces of jewelry, um, uh, little sort of touristic uh, elements. Uh, this piece does perhaps have a theme, which is maybe most clearly suggested by the, uh, the, the abbreviation CALIF, which stands for California, right there in the center. Uh, this may be an homage to her uh, adopted home state of uh, California, which she moved to from Arkansas in the 1950s. Uh, there's also in this piece, interestingly, uh, a couple of references to Native American culture. Uh, you can see on the lower right a kind of almost cartoonish sort of souvenir image of a Native American couple. Uh, Rosie Lee Tompkins also, in addition to making textiles, did a number of sculptural objects uh, in the 1980s and 90s. And in this case, we can see a group of these. And uh, you can see that her approach here is not dissimilar to her approach to some of these uh, appliqued textiles where she's taking a surface, in this case a bottle, and covering it with a disparate array of, generally speaking, found materials. Um, although in the work on the left, you can see that she has with her, you know, uh, some kind of material, I'm not sure what it is, begun to spell out her name, that you can see the E and the F on the upper left, so uh, short for Effie. But then right next to that, a little found um, slogan, Hell on Wheels, uh, very humorously connected to, to her, her own name. Uh, and then on the right, you can see another kind of subtle uh, but humorous um, arrangement of materials where she's taken an Elmer's glue cap but attached it to the top of a, of a soda bottle. So that has been covered with various kinds of uh, found textiles. So she's really um, picking and choosing the materials and arranging things as a kind of a, 
uh, an assemblage to arrive at a particular form, and, uh, and, and also importantly, uh, arrangement of colors that is appealing to, to her eye and her sensibility. And so moving on from these kind of eccentric uh, assemblage type works, uh, we can look at this wall, which has three uh, relatively simple uh, geometric uh, formal compositions. And all three of these quilts, uh, which were done in the mid 1980s, are variations on the theme of the medallion, which as I mentioned at the very beginning, is a very typical quilt technique where you uh, have, generally speaking, at the center, although not always, but uh, at, generally at the center of the composition, some kind of very uh, clear geometric shape, usually a square, but not always, that kind of focuses the composition and the eye. And you can see here how she has uh, done this, particularly in the work on the far right and in, in the middle. The work on the far right, uh, which is done in velvet, in greens, yellows, and blacks. You have a very clear central medallion uh, inside of which are uh, a, a kind of somewhat uh, uh, structured but a little bit eccentric uh, pattern of half squares and uh, framed sections of half squares. And, but the uh, curiously, the frame that contains this this whole uh, composition. It doesn't align. And it's that lack of alignment and that willingness to let things uh, kind of flow and have their own uh, life, if you will, that gives her work a peculiar sense of vitality and even motion. There's something uh, very organic about her compositions that is in contrast to the very rigorous regular geometry that I think many of us have come to think of as typical of uh, quilt design. This is another example from the mid 1980s on the same wall of a medallion that's kind of uh, gone off the rails, if you will, that seems to be almost breaking apart into shards. Another really wonderful thing about this quilt that's uh, very characteristic of Tompkins is the very subtle and powerful sense of color, a very unusual uh, sense of color. And in this case, if you look at uh, that kind of central geometric form, which may at first appear to be white, you can see that it's actually composed of very light pastel shades of yellow and pink. And that is set off uh, in contrast really wonderfully with these very deep and rich hues of uh, red and and black, and there's even some greens and some blues in the uh, surrounding area. And then on the far left of this wall, another work that has a central medallion uh, in which the, uh, the internal forms are both orderly and disorderly. Again, we've seen this uh, quite a number of times so far, this balance between order and disorder, between form and not quite chaos, but a kind of a dynamic. Um, uh, relationship among disparate types of formal elements. Here we have these uh, frames, strips, and half squares, and there's an upper and a lower border. Uh, here she has a relatively limited palette of reds and whites. Uh, one of the things I want to point out about this quilt is that uh, in this case, it, there, it is an example of a work in which the quilting matters from a visual perspective. So as I mentioned before, uh, Tompkins was really primarily only interested in the pieced tops, and uh, the quilting was usually done by other artists who Eli Leon found to attach the backing and the inner batting that uh, makes it into a, you know, a warm quilt. Uh, in most of Tompkins' quilts, the, uh, the, the practice of quilting doesn't result in much, if any, change in the the visual look of what you see in the, in the look of the piece top, uh, particularly in the velvets, the quality of the, the, the velvet itself and the intensity of the color overwhelmed any kind of stitching that might have been used to connect the piece top to the back. But in this case, you can see that the stitching that connects the top to the back, that is technically the quilting, uh, 
uh, does create a very strong and beautiful pattern across the surface that contrasts with and complements the very bold geometric design that Tompkins created with the pieces of red and white fabric. In this case, the quilting was done by Willia Etta Graham and Johnny Wade. On the next wall to the left are two smaller works. Uh, they're both made with velvet, and both of them are based on uh, a composition composed of repeated blocks or squares. In the work on the right, uh, which is very striking for this uh, orange and black palette, the regularity and orderliness of these repeated squares is broken at the upper right uh, in a really uh, dramatic and to me somewhat disturbing way. Uh, you know, you have these five sections that are very clearly framed uh, in, where the orange frames a group of four half squares and the geometry is very predictable and kind of regular. And then at the upper right, the frame completely breaks apart and you have what looks like a, um, an accident, but which clearly wasn't an accident because all of this was done quite deliberately. So I don't know what, what this means, but it conveys a Again, like I mentioned with the, the green velvet, there's an emotional quality to this that I think is suggestive of some kind of uh, psychological state um, or disturbance of some kind. Uh, and uh, it's a very mysterious work and very powerful for something uh, relatively small. Then as we go around the corner, we enter a room of uh, large velvet quilts, uh, all of which were done in the mid-1980s. Uh, on this first wall, we have three velvets that represent uh, kind of a very interesting range of approaches to, um, uh, to the use of velvet. Uh, and you can see in this first one, she has limited her palette to blues, whites, and blacks. Uh, it's a very moody kind of atmospheric quilt. It has an incredible um, presence in person, a little bit hard to see here uh, in, in this virtual space. Especially difficult to see here are the thousands, hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, sparkly elements that uh, are deployed across most of the quilt and really give it an incredible kind of um, radiance and shine that contrasts with the, the darkness of the fabric itself. Uh, and the piece really has a, a wonderful, uh, it, it has a sublime feeling, uh, very much like you might feel on an on a incredibly clear night where the sky is filled with, with stars. Uh, this piece, a uh, uh, square quilt, uh, obviously composed mostly of half squares in a palette of orange, blacks, browns, and blues. Kind of unusual palette, uh, but really visually satisfying the way the oranges and the blues play off of each other. But then you see at the lower left, uh, this kind of sudden eruption of a very different uh, formal logic right down there. Uh, at the lower left is a framed section, and inside that framed section, is a grid of squares, uh, square velvet, that is also distinguished by the fact that the palette is different. There are elements of green in here, uh, and it's, uh, it's very typical of Tompkins to allow for this kind of um, interruption of a, of a, of a variant uh, uh, logic in her, in her compositional approach. Um, and it just provides a, a kind of a visual interest that uh, takes what would otherwise be a fairly static uh, composition and formal logic and really makes it much more fresh and, and alive. Similarly here, you can see that she uh, juxtaposes a very stark uh, black and white pattern uh, that erupts in several places uh, in this uh, quilt 
against a very uh, palette that is very saturated, multicolored, and that contrast is uh, really quite remarkable um, and beautiful. Also, you'll note here um, something that we, we saw very early in this presentation, this incredible contrast of scale, uh, the uh, dramatic shifts in size between the pieces, uh, some of which are quite large, particularly some of these framed uh, medallion forms, uh, contrasted with some of the uh, tiny pieces, the tiny half squares and tiny blocks that are in some cases smaller than an inch um, in width. And going further into the gallery, uh, we encounter a number of larger scale velvet quilts. Uh, these were all done uh, in 86 and 87. Uh, this was a very uh, rich period for her, 1986 and 87. She made quite a number of really extraordinary pieces. And all of these were made uh, in these um, couple of years. Uh, this velvet quilt uh, is really wonderful in the way that she takes that sort of framed medallion and repeats it over and over and over again to create a kind of grid of medallions, each of which contains uh, a pattern of uh, half squares, sometimes blocks that have been uh, arranged in a grid, almost like a um, a quilt of quilts. Uh, and this is one of the few quilts that we have where we have some commentary by Tompkins herself on the particular quilt where she talks about the logic of uh, its making. And one of the really fascinating things that she says about this quilt is that she arrived at the color palette for this quilt. Uh, the selection of each and every color is based on her reading of the Bible. And so she, as she's reading through the Bible, through the, uh, the scripture, every time she encountered a reference to a particular color, she would uh, go out and find that, that color and uh, incorporate it into this quilt. And this is a good point to pause on a very important uh, fact about uh, Tompkins quilt making is that contrary to the somewhat typical approach uh, in quilt making where the maker often uses leftover materials from uh, clothing or bed sheets or what have you in their own home, Tompkins actively sought out particular materials. She uh, would shop at thrift stores and go out looking for particular types of fabric and as in this case, uh, often particular colors. Uh, this is another one of her large velvets from this period, and in this work we have a very distinctive large central medallion uh, that is composed of incredibly uh, beautiful, deep, rich uh, blues and blacks, um, and which is surrounded by a frame of saturated um, colors, various, various hues and shades. Um, this piece is one of my favorites, I think it's uh, like some of the others I've talked about, has a really unusually emotional uh, power for me. It's also interesting that it resonates very strongly with a quilt by Tompkins' mother, Sadie Lee Dale. Uh, it's the only quilt by Sadie Lee Dale that we have in the collection. Um, and it's in quite poor condition, which is why we weren't able to include it in the exhibition, but you can see an image of it here. And you can see that as in Tompkins' uh, quilt, this one also has, uh, it's a little bit difficult to see because it's in such poor shape, but you can see there was a central, a large central medallion surrounded by a very kind of complicated pattern geometric um, frame. And Tompkins did learn quilting from her mother uh, back in Gould, Arkansas, where she grew up. So uh, her mother was her, her teacher. Another wonderful example of a large velvet quilt, this one composed almost exclusively of a pattern of half squares. Uh, again, you can see this, it's given a kind of a particular dynamism, not only because of the beautiful um, range of colors uh, and tones, but also because of the shifts in scale. Um, Tompkins 
obviously loved color. And uh, she um, at one point wrote, I think it's because I love them so much that God let me see all these different colors. Again, this kind of sense of attributing her sensitivity to color to a, uh, a divine source. As we turn to the right, uh, you can see three more velvets. Um, the, the large one at the center is one of her largest quilts. And then on the right, uh, two somewhat oddly shaped, uh, very thin vertical uh, velvet quilts. And we'll start by just taking a look at this one, which is uh, about 10 feet wide, uh, so much larger than you'd need for, for any typical bed. And again, I, I really don't think that she was making quilts for beds. I think that uh, this really was a, a visual practice and for her a spiritual practice as well. So looking more closely at this piece, uh, one of the things that's most distinctive about it is this suggestion of a kind of a, a ghostly presence in the center. You can see that uh, it's almost suggested by the absence of uh, the higher keyed colors. There's a drop off in the center into deeper tones. Uh, um, the, the yellow and gold blocks kind of stay away from that center space. And it almost begins to look like some kind of figural um, uh, presence there in the middle. Uh, there are a couple of uh, incidents in this composition on the far right and far left where you see the logic of the, the grid of blocks broken by little incidents of uh, sort of quilts within quilts, these sections where tiny little pieces are put together into a, into a, a kind of a square shape or a strip shape. There are a few half squares that interrupt the logic of the uh, the checkerboard, um, but but overall, uh, you know, the uh, large part of the beauty of this, for me at least, comes from that wonderful sense of color, and again, offset against uh, black. These are the two vertical ones we saw uh, a few slides ago, uh, and these are done a bit later. Uh, the one on the um, uh, the left is undated, but I think it was probably from the 2000s. The one on the right we know was done in 2001. Um, and uh, you can see that her palette has shifted a little bit uh, at this point, but still working with velvet, still uh, embracing a kind of a very uh, complex logic of composition, incorporating very different kinds of forms into uh, a single a single work. And then uh, there we see on the left the large work that we already looked at and on the right uh, two quilts, uh, uh, relatively small, um, and these are both really focused on the half square, particularly the one on the left is uh, a remarkable uh, example of um, sort of pure half square composition where she's made those half squares in greens, blues, and oranges in a way that's almost uh, psychedelic. The contrast to those colors is so intense that uh, it almost makes your, your eye kind of wiggle as, as you look at it. Uh, this piece is, uh, these two pieces are not done in velvet. The one on the left is in polyester and the, the one on the right is in corduroy. And to my knowledge, it's the only work uh, in this show anyway, uh, and maybe of any in our collection uh, that was done in corduroy. And moving into another one of the galleries, uh, this gallery focuses largely on a particular kind of personal symbolism in Tompkins quilts. Uh, and this symbolism was focused around a special palette of colors, orange, yellow, and purple. Uh, she called this palette three sixes in reference to a group of family members who, whose birth dates all contain the number six, uh, including herself. She was born on September 6th, 1936. Uh, and for some reason, which I'm not sure why, she felt that this particular palette, orange, yellow, and purple, 
embodied this um, numerological condition of the three sixes. And you can see the quilt on the right is composed exclusively of this uh, palette of three colors. The one on the left uh, has these three colors in it, but it also includes some other colors. And it's kind of a, an intersection of uh, almost these two spaces, this personal space, we could say herself, with uh, other colors which may represent uh, the world she lived in. This is a quilt that she called a 36 nine patch. Uh, and a nine patch is traditionally a grid of nine equally sized square pieces of fabric that form a grid. And you can see here that she's done something very unusual with the nine patch. Uh, and you can see there are about 36 of them arranged across the surface here. Um, and you can see that rather than each of these patches being a regular grid of equal sized pieces, she has enlarged the center one and made it into a kind of a center of a pinwheel around which the remaining eight uh, pieces revolve. Also, if you look carefully, you can see that at the center of each one of these, for lack of a better word, pinwheels, there is a thread coming out. And these will remind you, I hope, of the ties that we saw very early on, the yellow ties in that piece in the first gallery that uh, is a traditional way of uh, connecting the front of a quilt to the back. In this case, they really do seem to be decorative. I don't think they're functioning here uh, the way a traditional tie would. Uh, but the, uh, the element itself uh, does come from that approach to quilt making. Uh, in any event, there are 36 of these nine patches, uh, although in point of fact, there are only 34 if you count them up. Uh, and I don't know if that's because she miscounted or something, but she interestingly makes up for the missing two by adding two of the little hanging ties uh, at other places in the, uh, the composition. So there are a total of 36 of the ties, even though there are only 34 nine patches. Uh, here are two other works incorporating this uh, very personal palette of purple, yellow, and orange. Uh, in this case, they're both um, obviously grids, uh, loose grids, very dynamic, almost um, uh, moving. There's a sense of vitality, kind of organic motion in these. And in the work on the left, again, as in the large quilt we saw in the other room, a kind of a suggestion of a, a, a kind of a, a central ghostly figure or absence, some kind of uh, energy space in the middle there that is suggested in this case by the lighter tone of the, the yellow blocks in the center that become so pale as to almost be white uh, that creates a kind of a very compelling um, sort of central void uh, in, that, in that quilt. And then as we turn to the right in this gallery, we encounter uh, three quilts that are somewhat unusual um, in Tompkins' uh, work for their formal simplicity. Uh, and you can see in this piece, it's a very, very simple uh, formal logic, a series of consecutive strips, each of which is made with uh, about three uh, strips that have been tied together or sewn together and then arranged uh, consecutively to create this uh, very large rectangular quilt that has the appearance of a kind of a ladder. There's definitely a sense of progression uh, as you move through it through the different tonalities. The palette is very muted compared to her other work, um, very uh, kind of quiet browns and grays and greens and a little bit of, of yellow here. Uh, this is a very uh, large quilt. Uh, it's uh, almost 12 feet high and um, very unusual again in her, in her work. You can see here two other pieces that 
have a somewhat similar uh, simplicity of form, although in these two, uh, the, the quality of color, the kind of high key color is a little bit more typical of, of Tompkins' work. Uh, the work on the far right, although it's kind of difficult to see in this image, is an example of a pieced top that has not been quilted. Um, there's one or two other examples in this exhibition of works that uh, where, you know, Rosalie Tompkins just did the piecing, but uh, Eli Leon, I guess, never got around to hiring uh, one of the other artists locally to add the, the quilt backing. And so if you were to see this in person, you, you'd see it's a very kind of thin, um, just sewn together array of pieces of cotton. And uh, that's why it's attached, as you can see there, to a different kind of, of backing. It's just pinned onto that, uh, that, that wood backing. In the next gallery on this wall are three examples of what Tompkins herself called her Christmas quilts. And she called them that because of the very uh, kind of sparkly material that she used to make them. And it's kind of difficult to see in these images, but these are very sparkly. All of these fabrics have uh, kind of glittery elements of metallic thread or, or uh, kind of sequin type uh, uh, elements attached to them that give them a really shiny, sparkly, um, very um, celebratory feel. Uh, and they're all uh, composed of framed sections of half squares, as you can see here. Um, uh, they vary in terms of the palette somewhat, but all share a basic uh, compositional logic of uh, roughly uh, geometrically gridded sections of differently sized framed half square blocks. And then to the left of the three Christmas quilts, you'll see on the wall there are two relatively small quilts. One of them is very small, uh, one of the smallest ones in the exhibition. Uh, and uh, we included this one in part just to show that even in a really small scale, Tompkins could be incredibly powerful, uh, visually, formally complex, and even, at least to my eye, kind of emotionally evocative. There's something really, to me, very um, moving about this particular combination of colors, the contrast of the warm and the cool tones. Uh, you can see here that she is juxtaposing as you move across the, uh, the, the, the quilt, um, a, a group of um, uh, blocks uh, strip, uh, put into strips and then arranged into the blocks, the purple and the black, and then half squares mixed with blocks and then just the yellow half yellow and black half squares. Uh, there is the kind of typical shift in scale as you move across the surface of this. Um, this is a, a velvet piece and part of the, the visual interest that she's able to convey even at such a small scale is the ability of velvet to um, have such different uh, visual effects depending on where you stand, the way the light hits it, and you can see at the bottom of the red section, some of that variation that comes from the way the light is hitting the, the velvet from different uh, angles. And that is increased very much when you see these works in person. To the left of that, another small work. It doesn't look small in the image because there's so much going on. It looks like how could this possibly be small, but it is. It's a small quilt that is, has an incredibly dense and condensed composition where the pieces that uh, are used to compose this, uh, uh, this work are really sometimes at the, the size of you know, a quarter inch uh, square, something like that. Um, as in some of the other works we've seen before, there is a really wonderful contrast between black and white and color. Uh, we see the typical uh, combination of uh, square blocks and half squares. But something else that we see here, uh, which we haven't seen for a while, is the incorporation of embroidered text. And if you look here, you can see on the left and also on the bottom, uh, if you look closely, uh, 
inscribed in her hand, she's embroidered these, these texts across the top, uh, are scriptural references. So you can see uh, it says Luke, uh, I think 36, 6, 7, something like that. So a reference to the book of Luke in the Bible. Um, and this becomes more and more common in her work are these um, uh, appearances of scriptural references that are embroidered onto the surface of the, of the quilts. Um, in the same gallery, but on the, on the uh, perpendicular wall are three quilts uh, that are all somewhat pictorial in nature. Some of her found material may have uh, imagery on it. We saw that in the first gallery with the quilt that had the floral motifs, uh, images of flowers uh, scattered throughout. Uh, this is something she comes back to in the 90s in a much more focused and in some cases really overtly thematic way. Uh, these, are, these three are all quite large uh, quilts, about 10 feet or more in width. In this one, you can see scattered throughout are images of uh, dancers. There's a male and female dancer. It's the same figures, uh, the motif repeated uh, throughout in that central section. And that's interspersed with, you know, abstract elements, uh, the kind of the typical half square uh, and um, gridded blocks that we've seen before. Uh, in this work here, we see, uh, again, a variety of images. Uh, an image of Christ uh, at the bottom, and this is a, a sort of a, a, a carpet, that kind of thing you'd buy and hang on the wall, uh, not, not for the floor, but it's a, a devotional image of, of Christ with angels and a landscape. And above that, a figure of uh, two, uh, a male and a female couple dancing. So kind of a humorous, I think, a juxtaposition of the sacred and the profane. There are in this quilt a number of references that take one across a variety of cultural spaces on the lower right, uh, uh, what's probably from a, a t-shirt, a souvenir t-shirt from Hawaii, uh, just to above to the left of that, what looks like a, a Mexican um, fabric uh, design. And then on the lower left, uh, some kind of odd and humorous uh, French poodles. And then throughout this composition, you see broken apart in a really dynamic and compelling way are fragments of the American flag. Uh, the stars and the stripes uh, separated into different sections. And this begins to suggest uh, the possibility that she's really thinking in a coherent thematic way about America and about the diversity of the American experience. Uh, so in this one, uh, we see you know, a more explicit uh, reflection on America. I think it's, it's quite clear that this was her intent. In this case, you see the American flag again, both whole and broken apart, spread throughout the composition. But right in the center, you have a souvenir uh, tapestry, uh, carpet kind of thing you put on the wall of uh, the Kennedy brothers uh, flanking Martin Luther King Jr. And then moving to the right down this wall are uh, two quilts. Uh, the one on the left is another pictorial quilt, which I'll talk about in a minute. And on the right, a very large abstract. Both of these uh, incorporate a significant amount of Tompkins' own embroidered uh, text. So here you can see uh, in this quilt that she has quite a number of found images, uh, all of which have to do with African and African-American men. Uh, you see O.J. Simpson, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan. Uh, there's a, a, some kind of a t-shirt, I think, or uh, maybe just a souvenir textile that shows Nelson Mandela, um, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Elijah Muhammad, and so on. So very powerful, important figures uh, in the sports and political world. Those images and adjacent areas of fabric are covered uh, literally with her own embroidered text. And if you look at the left, you can see her name, Effie, and her birth date, 9636, which is followed immediately by uh, a scriptural allusion, uh, John 316. Uh, and then throughout, there are many, many books of the Bible, many chapters of the Bible that are alluded to. There are some scholars that have been looking into this to see if there is actually a, 
relationship between the passages in the Bible that are alluded to and these um, particular people or their historical context. Uh, and that's still a puzzle that uh, has kind of yet to be completely deciphered. One of the interesting details of this uh, quilt, you can see on the right and a little bit in the center, there's a number of crosses. And on the lower right, the largest of the crosses on the lower right, embroidered uh, the words Michael, Love, and Effie. So her name, uh, Michael, probably Michael Jordan, who appears above, and the word love. And to the right of this uh, uh, pictorial quilt on the wall is this very large abstract quilt, about 14 feet high. This is another piece that uh, does not have a quilt backing. Uh, it is just the, the piece tops. It's a little bit hard to see here uh, in this uh, digital image, but the entire top and much of the left-hand side is covered with uh, her own uh, text, em embroidered text, uh, which again is her name, her birth date, uh, and uh, biblical references. In this final gallery in the exhibition, we're really focused on the final decade of her life. Um, she died in 2006. So all of these works were done between 2000 and 2006. And you can see that um, she began to really work concertedly at a, at a smaller scale, although not exclusively, because the work we just saw, the 14 foot high piece, was also done in this decade. But many of the works in this last decade were smaller. Uh, and do have a kind of more maybe personal, uh, devotional quality. The religious and spiritual themes really come to the foreground, both in the representation of the cross, uh, the biblical references um, become really a clear uh, thematic subject in the work. This is a, a relatively rare example of a work that is just in black and white. Uh, I know of one other piece that she did uh, just in black and white that is actually not in this exhibition or in our collection. But uh, in this piece, you see uh, the, the kind of central area is a um, uh, really dynamic uh, arrangement of half squares of various sizes uh, that gives it this kind of almost um, whirlpool effect. It really seems to almost spin around and then uh, highlighted against some of the, the white uh, half squares are crosses and then around the outside her name, her birth date, and uh, scriptural references. To the left of that, uh, another work with lots of scriptural references, a cross, and in this case the palette limited to black and orange. And uh, it's wonderful how she alternates the color of the embroidered text to highlight it against the underlying color. Here are two small pieces uh, done with denim and uh, appliqued elements. Uh, very kind of lyrical, open-ended um, compositions. Uh, the pieces seem to float against these kind of almost sky blue backgrounds. The crosses, the same colors, the background almost blend in. Uh, these are very um, quiet but beautiful, um, uh, kind of unexpected uh, in terms of the, the eccentricity of the, of the compositions and the kinds of materials she's included, but strangely beautiful. Um, Another small work where the compositional elements uh, consist of a grid of half squares. You can see there's four half squares that form this larger overall square and against that uh, various crosses. And it looks as if the ones on the bottom are right side up and the ones on the top are upside down. Uh, I recall hearing, uh, perhaps it was one of her um, grandchildren mentioned to me that they had seen this in her home uh, sort of resting on the back of the couch so that, or a chair, so that all of the crosses were right side up. Uh, so when it was in her home, it was um, kind of presented in a way that all the crosses would have been right side up. Uh, this is one of my, uh, my favorite pieces. I just think that it's, it's so powerful and yet so restrained. Uh, again, very small scale, probably not more than a foot and a half by two feet, something like that. 
a very limited palette, just brown on white, extremely simple forms, a grid of uh, black, uh, rather brown and white squares overlaid with brown crosses, but it, it carries such uh, powerful uh, emotional um, strength. Uh, there's something very uh, solid and uh, uh, certain about it. I, I think it's a very, very strong and beautiful piece. Then moving along this wall, you can see the three works on the left of this image. Uh, and it's interesting that at this late stage in her career, she introduces all of a sudden a very different and new uh, technique, which is called a yo-yo. And you see these uh, six black circles in the center. These are what in quilting terminology is called a yo-yo. And it's a, it's a piece of fabric that is sewn to form a kind of a um, a rosette or a, a kind of a decorative circle that's kind of pinched in the middle. It's a little hard to see in the black, but we'll see some more colored ones later where it's clear how they're made. Uh, and in a typical quilt, uh, the the yo-yos are, the, the quilter will try to make the yo-yos at an identical size and they'll be arranged in an absolutely orderly geometric composition. And it's sort of all about that. How do you take these round shapes and turn them into a geometric uh, orderly geometric form. Clearly that is not how Tompkins is using the yo-yos. Here she's using them as visual accents. Uh, we know that she was very interested in numerology. We know that she's interested in the number six and there you see her name, her birth date 9636. And so it's probably no accident that there are six um, yo-yos here. She also has the name Calvin uh, there, which is a relative, and Gould, which is the town in Arkansas that she grew up in, combined with uh, some biblical uh, allusions to biblical scripture. And to the left of that, another uh, piece with these appliqued yo-yos. Again, these would all have been made by Tompkins herself. You can see here quite a variety of uh, colors and shapes. Uh, and you can see here in some of the colored ones, the way that the, the circle is made of uh, fabric that's kind of pinched together in the middle. So these really have dimension to them. They're, they're three-dimensional forms that kind of attach to the outside, of, uh, to the top of the, the quilt. You can see again, her name at the top, Effie, uh, the cross, her birth date on the upper right, 9636. Uh, and I mentioned her interest in numerology and numbers and uh, this was very important for her, and we know, uh, you can see that reflected here, because she was 68 years old uh, when she made this, and there are precisely 68 yo-yos in this quilt. Uh, another yo-yo piece, in this case on a brown uh, background, uh, with her, her name, her birth date, and uh, multicolored yo-yos. And on this last wall, we have uh, two really uh, beautiful, powerful, somewhat unusual works uh, by Tompkins. On the right, a piece of green fabric, and then the work itself consists exclusively of green embroidered text uh, that she embroidered onto the fabric, and something which is a little bit difficult to see, but scattered throughout are also green crosses that are made from the same green fabric. So they almost disappear into the composition. Uh, the text itself uh, consists of her name, as you see at the top, Effie Mae Howard, her birth date, followed by uh, all of the addresses where she lived, beginning in Gould, with Gould, Arkansas, going on to several addresses in Richmond, California. There are some uh, references to scripture, the Psalms, and so on. And then in between uh, several scriptural references is the phrase that uh, just kind of wonderfully appears as if out of nowhere that says, love is like an ice cream cone, it gets better with each lick. And then she goes back to the Psalms and so on. And then this work, which was done in the last year of her life, it was done in 2005, which is a quite large piece. It's a very large piece of uh, black fabric onto which she has attached at the top almost a hundred black yo-yos uh, along with uh, some text. And it's hard not to read this as a, a kind of intimation of mortality. Uh, it has very much a feeling of uh, memorial uh, about it. And um, 
it's really remarkable that this is one of the last quilts that Rosie Lee Tompkins made. Thank you for joining me on this virtual tour. I'm Larry Rinder. I'm the director and chief curator of BAM PFA, and I co-curated this exhibition with Elaine Yao. And thank you for joining us. I hope you'll come see the exhibition itself when we reopen in a month or so. <laughs>